so long. She was planning for a great celebration as her daughter graduated from college. She had all the things planned out. Everything was lined up with the components of the party. There was one thing that was missing, and that was to pick up the special graduation cake that she had ordered at a local uh, store. However, when she got into the store, she found out that, in fact, they, they didn't have the cake. Something had gone wrong, and they'd failed to get it decorated the way that they should. She was very upset, but they were apologetic, gave her some credit, and said, well, you can pick any cake that we have, and we'll decorate it for you special for free. So she did. She picked out a cake, and they decorated it, and she was very pleased with the outcome. That night at the graduation party, as all the guests were gathered and the time came for them to cut the cake, that's when they notice. You can't really tell from the picture, but it's a block of styrofoam. <laughs> when you think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, in the passage that uh, Wade read for us this morning, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount uses two very common elements to help us to understand what it means to be a Christian. One is salt, the other is light. This morning I want to focus on verse 13 in particular. What does it mean for us to be the salt of the earth? When I think of that graduation cake that Marcy had picked up at the store that morning. You know, no matter how <coughs> fancy and nice you decorate the outside, it doesn't change the fact that it's a block of styrofoam in the middle. When we come to Jesus' description here in Matthew chapter 5 of what it means, what it's like to be a disciple of Jesus, Jesus is concerned not so much on the outward decoration. He's concerned about what's inside. And so he gets very personal. In fact, I would like for you to, to consider this verse 13 as if there's no one here but you. And Jesus is sharing with you, this is what he expects to find in you as a disciple of Jesus. When you think about salt, one of the first things that comes to mind is its importance. And when you consider the various systems that we have in our body, the way that we are created by God, every one of these systems requires salt. Salt is necessary. We need salt. One source says that sea salt contains about 80 mineral elements that the body needs. And so when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, he's not only is he getting personal, but he's also getting very basic. And so I like for us I'd like for you to ask three, four <coughs> questions this morning relative to this verse, you are the salt of the earth. The first question I think we need to ask is what are we? What does it mean for us to be the salt of the earth? Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. Now the phrase salt of the earth is something that's been used, it's been... Um, taken over by our society, it's used usually as a compliment to somebody that's saying that they're trustworthy, they're dependable. These are salt of the earth kind of people. What does it mean when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth? And I think that as we go through these questions this morning, it'll become evident to us what Jesus means. But there's one thing that I think we need to understand from the very beginning. Whatever it means, you are the salt of the earth. When Jesus made that statement, 
he was talking about the relationship that you have with Jesus. You can't be the salt of the earth if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You can't be the salt of the earth if you're not concerned about living your life for God, conforming your life and your choices to Jesus. Whatever Jesus has in mind when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he has it in relationship, our relationship to him. Because of my relationship to Jesus, that is what makes me the salt of the earth. And so when we say or use the phrase, the salt of the earth, in the context in which Jesus is using it, he's saying that our identity of who we are is wrapped up and tied up in our relationship to Jesus. In um, the Roman culture of the day, salt was very important. In fact, salt was valuable. Salt was used sometimes to pay Roman soldiers for their work. In fact, that's worked into our <coughs> vocabulary as well. Because when we use the word salary, that comes from the base word for salt. So Rome, in Roman culture, salt was very important. In the Greek culture, the word for salt could also be translated divine. In the Arabic word, salt was used to seal and to confirm a covenant between two people. So we have a covenant between you and, and me where we'll draw up a contract. But in the Arab world, they used salt because salt was a commodity. Salt was valuable. In the Jewish religion of the Old Testament, the sacrificial system, the priests and the Levites, the sacrifices required salt. <coughs> and so you see salt is very valuable. <coughs> and it's also valuable for us. Our relationship to Jesus, my relationship with Jesus, your relationship with Jesus gives you a value that you can find nowhere else. Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God <coughs> through Jesus Christ. And then just a few verses later, he says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. We can read on, and you can read on and, and see that because the relationship you have with Jesus, that gives you value in God's eyes. That's what I think Jesus had in mind when he said to those that were listening to him deliver this famous sermon, you are the salt of the earth. Because of your relationship with Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. The second question, why are we the salt of the earth? This verse is very interesting because it... Uh, helps us to understand, I think, what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you sit down in a library that's filled with commentaries and books that will enhance your Bible study, and you start looking through what these sources have to say of what exactly does Jesus mean when he says you are the salt of the earth you're going to come up with a variety of answers that these people sat down and studied this verse and uh, they 
have come up with the ideas of this is what Jesus has in mind when he says, you are the salt of the earth. You're indispensable, you're valuable, you have a purity. Uh, and that's an interesting one because it's based solely on the color of salt. Salt's white, so it's pure. It stings, it irritates, it creates thirst, it flavors, it's a preservative. It's used in sacrifices, it's used in covenants, and it's beneficial for our health. It symbolizes hospitality, and it also symbolizes power. In fact, I found one source that was very consistent with what many of the other writers have to say, but this one source makes this uh, statement. Unlike the parable of the sower, where Jesus gives explicit explanation on what the various elements of the parable means, where uh, here the reader is left to come to an understanding of these images on the basis of how these things are used in the world around them. We must then seek to understand what is it that we are to understand about salt of the earth and how we are as Christians the salt of the earth. So I just listed 13 different conclusions that people have made. And that's the reason why we don't preach commentaries. We have to go back to the word. Because did Jesus not specify in Matthew chapter 13 and verse, chapter 5 and verse 13, what salt does? He says right there, but if salt loses its flavor. So why are we the salt of the earth? Jesus says our interaction with the world gives flavor. He talks about the being persecuted in the verses right before Matthew 5 and verse 13. When the world of the first century took a bite of the church, they tasted grace. They tasted salt because we are the salt of the earth. I don't know for sure what to say about this. But there was a, a fellow in England who thought it would be a good idea to put his head in a microwave and then fill up all the remaining space with plaster. They, his friends tried for about an hour to get him free before they called the fire department to come in. The fire department worked about two hours before they were able to get this guy's head out of this microwave. Now, how long will he have to live to live this down? He's going to be remembered by those who know him for the rest of his life as you're the guy that got your head stuck in the microwave for two and a half hours. But more seriously, how will I be remembered? How will you be remembered? Will you be remembered as a flavor that you are able to impart to the world around you because of your relationship with Jesus, because you are the salt of the earth? We should be remembered for our relationship and what that relationship with Christ does to change us, to help us to grow, to help us to become the disciples that Jesus wants us to be. Third question is, how are we the salt of the earth? And to answer this question, you have to take a step back from chapter 5 and verse 13 and consider the context in which Jesus made this statement. And when you do that, you encounter the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, and that that salt imparts flavor to the world, I think what he's saying is if you live the Beatitudes, or even more broadly, if you live the word of God in your life, then you will be the salt of the earth. If you step back a little bit further, and you look at Matthew as a whole, we come to the very last words of the gospel, words that we're very, very familiar with. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You could, without doing violence to this text, you could replace the word disciples with salt. Because when a person obeys the Great Commission and another person comes to Christ, they are making salt. When a person is converted to Jesus, he becomes salt. He becomes valuable. He becomes special. He has that special relationship. This is how salt is made in Matthew 5 and verse 13. So the question that we are left with is probably the most important question that we can ask about this verse. Am I the salt of the earth? Jesus says at the end of verse 13 that if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, he says, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. <coughs> the question, am I the salt of the earth, is probably the most rhetorical question that a Christian can ask because there's not an option that Jesus gives here. He doesn't say you can become the salt of the earth or you might be the salt of the earth. He doesn't lay down any kind of restrictions other than looking at his disciples who are following him. He says you are the salt of the earth. There's no option. If you're a child of God, Jesus is looking at you and saying, you are the salt of the earth. There's not a question about it. The question is, have you lost your seasoning? Jesus says that if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Now, Jesus was living in a world that's different from ours, where we can go and buy pure salt. The salt that was used in the first century was salt that was gathered usually around the Dead Sea, or that was brought up from the Mediterranean Sea. And then that salt was used then to preserve food and to flavor and to season, all the things that salt does. But the salt that they had was mixed with other kind of elements. And so you could take that salt and you could use that salt until all of the salt is used from that lump and you're going to have something left over that's of no value, that's of no use. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what he wants you to know is that you're valuable to him. And if you're not careful, you can lose your seasoning. 
All you have to do is flip over to Revelation chapter 2 and read what Jesus had to say to the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus in the book of Acts and in the letter that was written to them, they had a very special relationship with the Lord. They were pivotal for the evangelizing of the entire area of Asia Minor. But by the end of the first century, when Jesus looked at them, he says, you have lost your first love. You're losing your seasoning. You're not growing as you should. You're perilously close to falling away. So every one of us that's here this morning that's a child of God, every one of us that's been baptized for the forgiveness of his sin, we are the salt of the earth. But have we lost our flavoring? Have we lost our seasoning? We can do it by disobedience. We can do it by carelessness. We can do it by indifference. We can do it by a refusal to study and a refusal to grow. We can lose our essential flavoring that we have through our relationship with Jesus. A number of years ago, during the Civil War actually, in the uh, area around Florence, Alabama, there was a gang of ruffians that were <coughs> terrorizing the area. And they were led by a man who referred to himself as Mountain Tom Clark. And Tom Clark didn't care about anybody. He had no feelings. He could kill children, he could kill uh, women, he could kill men, and, and he did. And as he was going about bullying all the people that were in this area, he had a kind of a catchphrase that he uh, liked to use. And he would always tell people, nobody runs over Mountain Tom Clark. He did what he wanted to do. He didn't care about anybody. He didn't, wasn't controlled by anybody. He did what he wanted to do. Then they caught him. They tried him and they hung him. And the people, uh, the leaders of uh, Florence decided that what we're going to do is we're going to bury him in the cemetery. We got a plot, it's not going to be marked, we're just going to put his body in there and we're going to forget about Mountain Tom Clark. But the people of Florence said, no, I think we have a better idea. So rather than putting his mortal remains in a graveyard, they buried him underneath Tennessee Street. And every day, it is estimated that about 20,000 people run over Mountain Tom Clark every day. Did you notice what Jesus said about you and, and me in verse 13? He says, it is salt loses its flavor. Then it becomes useless. Its only value is to be thrown out and to become sidewalks and roads. To be walked on every day. To have no value. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth... He's wanting us to realize that because of our relationship with him, we have value and we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to the world around us, to influence it for good, to exude the flavoring of Christ through our relationships with others and to help the world to come to know who Jesus <coughs> is. You and I have a vital role in that because we are the salt of the earth this morning 
when you think about your relationship with Jesus, have you lost your flavoring? Have you lost your ability to season and to impact the world in which we live? If you have, Jesus can make you strong again. If you've never come to Jesus to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, this morning you can become the salt of the earth. You can become valuable in God's sight because you have become the salt of the earth in Jesus' Jesus' hands. If we can help you in your relationship with Jesus this morning, then please come and give us that opportunity as we stand and sing. Oh.